So as you can see, Anthony is very popular already. So he uh, started working with us about six months ago, and he just finished. Uh, he was just finishing his PhD in, in the Aries Institute in India, the Aryabhata Research Institute of Observational Sciences in of the Raipur University in Nagitan. I, I memorized all that. Pretty and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, he, he has a lot of expertise on, on infrared uh, from calibration of infrared telescopes back in India to uh, performing actual observations with them. And, uh, and uh, his uh, uh, research interests are around the uh, variability in wave flows, uh, accretion of phenomena, uh, that, that kind of thing, no? so, which is what, what he's uh, doing here as well. So he will, he will give a colloquium on that. So let's thank Arvon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to present this. Talk. It is actually my PhD work that I have done. Where, uh, it is on this episodically accreting young low mass stars and a little bit of the instrument calibrations on the telescopes back there. So, here is one small video about what these kind of stars are like, how they suddenly the accretion from the inner disk increases and how they suddenly brighten up. And uh, moving on, this is like the flow chart of my talk. This will be so. First, I will give a little bit of introduction and then the various facilities that I have used, and then the two sources, and then final and uh, that I have worked on, and the, um, the calibrations of these two instruments. And finally, I could summarize. So, just moving on. So, what are these? Uh, this is the uh, scheme of the LOMAS. Isolated low mass star evolution, as given by as given by Sue Adams and Lada, and it starts after the protostellar cores has formed, and and from that how the protostars have formed at at around this time scales when the class zero stage are formed, and then and as if the system evolves, how the a circular uh, envelope of the core, it just gradually dissipates and the disk is formed and there is a remnant envelope and gradually with all the accretion and outflows, this envelope is uh, blown away and you only have this uh, disk and also as it matures towards the pre stage, the disk is also dissipated and you only have the planets and all. And alongside it, you can see if you plot the ECD of the various, um, the spectral energy distribution and the various stages of evolution, how it moves from the longer wavelengths towards the shorter wavelengths. And so why does the, this episodically accreting stars uh, uh, remain in this grand scheme of things? So, oh sorry. So yeah, so you, you will see this, uh, this stage of um, this stage, mainly in the class one and two stages when there is a still uh, may, there can be or may not be a remnant envelope, but there is a wave form disk, and in the center there is a pre sequence star. So, what is episodic accretion? Episodic accretion is basically a sudden increase in the enhancement of the accretion rate from the circumstellar disk onto the pre sequence star, and it is mainly triggered by various disk instabilities. And this phenomena is a fairly a new phenomena. It was first of, uh, reported in 1936 when the first Category of this source, if you were present in the Orion, Orion star forming region, it uh, suddenly brightened up by around five magnitudes in the optical bands. But it was only in 1966 when G.H. Herbig first realized that it represents an important stage in the star formation. And uh, alongside it, you can see the pattern morphology of this kind of these uh, sources and uh, the different movements that you need to prove the different parts of the spectrum uh, of these sources. And so as more and more these kind of sources were uh, discovered, it was, uh, we found out that it was found that it, it displayed a variety in their light curves. Like some had a very long uh, and big outburst and had a very slow decay like a few or like 1057 or 15, Sydney, while the others had a very short uh, outburst magnitude and also they had repetitive outburst. So they were subclassified into two types, like the, those which followed the outburst of the epiori were named as epiores, and those who followed uh, the type of X loopy, the outburst type of X loopy, it were, uh, they were termed as XORs or their weaker cousins. 
So now I'll move on and to give a brief uh, characteristic of this kind of sources like the FUs and XORs. Like the FUs, you will always see it will be like uh, surrounded by a reflection nebula when it undergoes an outburst, and the outburst luminosity will be a very large, like 100 to 300 solar luminosities. And one, and if we take a spectra in the optical or in the near infrared, all, all the spectral features we find it in absorption, which denotes that these um, very powerful outflowing winds are emanating are coming out from these sources. And till now, what is one of the main uh, feature of these FUOs is the burst decay time. It is like till now, no FUOs has come back to its initial pre outburst stage. It is speculated that each one outburst lasts around 20 to 100 years. But still now, it is not no if you are has returned back to its initial state. And here is the characteristics of the X source. They have like uh, low lower magnitude of outburst variations, and the outburst luminosities can vary around a few tens of solar luminosities. And uh, one of the and the burst decay time here it can be like like in the scale of few years, like one or two years. And uh, it can have a lower accretion rates. Mind it like this in the case of if viewers, the accretion rates can be very high. It can rise around 10 to the power minus uh, to around 10 to the power minus 4 solar mass. But in this case, it can it is a moderate to low uh, moderate accretion rate of around 10 to the power minus 7 to 10 to the power minus 5 solar mass per year. And uh, here is you can and this during the outdoor stages, this can be very much will. Uh, uh, Esther found out visually also. If you can see this source, this is one of uh, an typical XOR source, as a sun 13 degree. This was taken during the outburst stage, and if and if you see when it returns back to its poison state or the pre pre outburst stage, how it changes. This can also be unlike uh, you can quantify it by giving the CCD plates or something with, with the naked eye. So, what are the, why should uh, we be concerned about this phenomena, these episodic accretions? So, what are the major implications of this kind of sources? So, there are the, these are the three main implications: is the luminosity problem, the chemical evolution, and the angular momentum problem. So, first, I will talk about the luminosity problem. So, about when when we see about the uh, theoretical isochrones of the evolutionary isochrones by Young, Evans and Paul, Kinian and all, you, we see like all the theoretical isochrones, they are overestimating the luminosity than the actual observed luminosity. That is, whenever we observe these luminosities, they are actually very low. And this was a discrepancy, the observed luminosities. And this could be possibly explained by the episodic accretions because the um, why the phenomenon of episodic accretion? This is because uh, the episodic accretion time scales are of the um, uh, in the time scales of few years or so. It has a very short time scale, and uh, most of the stars they are um, they generally remain in the pre sequence stars remain in the quiescent stage or in the pre outburst stage, and the outburst stage duration is very slow uh, is very small. So we generally see them in the um, pre outburst or the poison stages. So that is why it can be it is underreported like that. Well, if we take into account the episodic accretion, this phenomena can be well constrained. Then is the chemical evolution of the protoplanetary disk during the events of um, uh, episodic accretion. The inner disk temperature can rise to around uh, uh, more than six thousand degree Kelvin. So. At, at that at that high temperatures, um, many different chemical processes happen, like the formation of silicates and all, and other and other complex compounds, which generally has implications in the formation of uh, planetesimals, which then evolve into planets. So this otherwise in the Poisson stages, the temperatures are very low, which are not exactly which does not permit those complex chemical reactions to happen. And the second, the last one is the angular momentum problem. Like when the star, when um, uh, this main sequence stars, uh, the main, uh, when it right, when it uh, evolves into the main sequence stars, it has most of the around ninety percent or more than that of the star of the mass of the core, but it only has one percent of the angular momentum of the core. So how does this uh, how does this angular momentum dissipates? So now. <laughs> 
most of the now the current understanding is that most of the, the that angular momentum when is trans is uh, thrown away into the interstellar medium uh, in the in interstellar medium in the form of outflows which help to conserve the angular momentum and also helps in the stability of the frame and second stars so these were the uh, main my thesis motivations with which i started working in this project so like uh, how the if we can constrain the existing models or develop a new model, or how if we can address all this luminosity problem and all, and if we can verify this um, the magnetospheric accretion model by Jordina on for these two sources on other sources also. So using this, we started our observations, and we, I used a very variety of like Indian facilities and also international facilities. These two are international Indian facilities, and this is one an international facility. It is also part of the SGSS network, the in front, the Apache Point Observatory. And this is a, which was from my home um, previous institute. It is it was an in-home in uh, telescope. It is called the Devastar Fast Optical Telescope, and this is a uh, two meter class telescope, uh, which is known as Eight City. And these are the other facilities that I have used, like the Thaimis National Telescope, and this is currently the last in India in the infrared range, and I have also used this one. And uh, these are the various archival facility data facilities that I have used. And moving on, I will present about the first major findings of this source and then Gaia 20 EAE. So these are the coordinates of these are the coordinates of the these are the coordinates of the source. And it is located in the W51 star forming complex between these two uh, sources, um, these two compact H2 regions, IRS, uh, IRS uh, or you can say uh, uh, term as MC1 and the MC2. And, and you can check, and it is at a distance of like this. And from the, <coughs> the these two MC1 and MC2 at 1.3 kbc and 3.4 kbc. And the distance to Gaia from Gaia DL3 distance sessions comes out to be around 3.2 kbc. So it we can say that it is loosely associated to the uh, MC2 um, uh, compact H2 region. And how come we became interested in this source? So as on the Gaia photometric alert system, it sounded out an alert on uh, this day that this source suddenly has brightened by around four magnitudes in the in the Gaia optical bands. So then we started monitoring the source, and this is how the, you can see visually how it changes changed from the pre outburst to the post out and during the outburst stages the variation in the optical filters, and this is how the light curve on the uh, historical light curve of the source, and this is how the outburst light curve is, and these are the different facilities that I used to man, uh, monitor the source. And uh, if I zoom in the outburst stage, you can see how it quickly brightened during the outburst stage. It quickly brightened by around 0.1 magnitude per day in the optical bands, in the ZTA band, the weekly transient bands. And after it reaching, after reaching the uh, maximum brightness, it then again started to uh, decay by 0 0.01 mag per day. So then. To how to verify whether it is an um, the, the brightness change was actually an accretion dominated region or whether it has been due to the change in act and the extension of the source. We performed this uh, ACD evolution. So we plotted the quiescent phase and the active state in uh, spectral energy distribution. And we can see that the active phase act and the outer state ACD has jacked up from the quiescent state. So then we plotted uh, the difference in the magnitudes on the of the on the various bands from optical to mid infrared with the dust dust laws to see whether it is correspond correlating with them. So we use the uh, the dust laws of two mag and four mag for RV three point one, which is the normal interstellar extinction, and RV five point five, which is the highest extinction found in typically found in the star forming regions. So and then we and then we found out that it is not correlating. So it might it must be an accretion um, very um, this source must be undergoing an accretion change. So moving on, we then uh, obtain the spectra of these sources and the various dates. You can see with the two meter HCT 
and these are in the optical bands and you can see how the various and you can see on the h beta sodium d lines and h alpha how it uh, showed the powerful outflows coming out during the this event of accretion and h alpha shows, uh, showed a typical p signy profile which shows like a very heavy outflow region from regions uh, close to the accretion funnels and also like the another another part of which came out from our study was the infrared uh, spectra near infrared spectra like uh, uh, typically this uh, the helium 10 30 line which i am particularly fond of it and this helium triplet lines it, it is one of the signatures of the excess uh, uv or uh, x uv emissions uh, that are uh, emitted during because of the inflow increased inflow of material from onto the surface. So those flux and those uh, emissions are uh, intercepted by this helium uh, 1030 atoms in the in the atmosphere in the disk atmosphere and they give rise to the strong signal absorption signal and uh, it, it acts as a proxy of their on determining that source. Uh, the increased emissions and due to the accretion processes. And also we can see this is the CO banded profiles which we found out to be in emissions which states that the uh, the accretion rate was high but still the inner, inner protoplanetary disk atmosphere was in the temperature at that that was not higher than that of the um, the, than the photospheric temperature of the planet sequence star. Um, so it uh, gave out an information about the temperature relation between the inner disk and that of the photospheric temperatures. And then we obtained this uh, high resolution spectroscope, uh, resolution spectra from the 10 meter Hubble telescope uh, through, and there also we could see this deep uh, emission in the helium 10 30 line. Unfortunately, it has a cutoff range of at around 10 20 so we could not measure the whole spectrum with the Hubble Verde telescope. But uh, but the Hubble Verde telescope with the HPF, we could found out a very faint like this, um, the different hydrogen um, bastion lines in the spectrum, which also again sounded out that this has been accreting um, via the magnet because of the enhanced magnetospheric accretion which was also corroborated by the presence of the emission features in the calcium triplet lines. So one of the major findings of this paper uh, of our study was finding this rate shifted absorption feature in the calcium triplet lines that were found in the high resolution spectra with HPL. Uh, in HVT. So this uh, this absorption feature could not be explained in the in the simple sense of outflows or like that. So what we conjectured is that we are maybe seeing the source like in with some vantage point like this, like there is an increase in the density gradient level. So with that we could uh, in, we could uh, possibly constrain the viewing angle to that <coughs> that we are viewing in this some special angle. And move, uh, these are the major conclusions of this study. And uh, then moving on to the next source, uh, which I studied was uh, this one, which was a bona fide FU word, uh, 2493. So this is how the source was the pre outburst image of the source. And when it went on to outburst, you can see how the system evolved. And it is located in the Gulf of Mexico in the signal star forming region at a distance of 7.5 kiloparsec and uh, these are the coordinates of the source and uh, these are on the total light curve of this source and uh, during the outburst and during our the phase we started from around 2014 to 2021. One of the interesting features during our uh, study was that the mid infrared uh, light curve consistently became uh, started to brighten again however we see there is a near constancy or a, or a, this steady decline, a very little bit decline in the brightness in the optical bands, which pricked our which made us uh, interesting, which uh, pricked our interest in this source. So we first studied the color evolution of this source. So in the optical bands, we can see that how the source became suddenly from gray, it started to become blue, and though it was in the outburst state. And that, but it and the colors become consistently greater. 
Then we studied uh, the we use we, we tried to find out how the source evolved in the infra near infrared and in the mid infrared. So here are the near infrared results. Um, in the near infrared, we saw that it is following the optical colors as how it is steadily declining, uh, becoming red the colors. But the most interesting uh, result was that in the mid infrared colors. In the mid infrared, we can see like how steadily the colors were becoming blue, which were completely opposite to that of the, in the color evolution in the optical and the mid infrared band uh, and the near infrared bands. Then we tried to study the ACD of the source, and the ACD was also almost a constant. It was not varying in the different years that we studied. So, uh, so how to explain this uh, apparent anomaly between the mid infrared color evolution and the optical color evolution? So recent, uh, so recent times, uh, Liu in 2022, they uh, provided a model also mass curves for this kind of sources. If uh, these sources, the the accretion rate varies from uh, for uh, different mass ranges and different accretion rates, and both in the optical colors and in the mid infrared colors. So as how the accretion rate it, it steadily becomes increasing, how it changes in the evolution in the in this parameter space will be. So with this, we plotted, we did, we replotted our light, uh, our color evolution using the isomass curves, and we found out that it is following the same pattern. So it is also following the same pattern, like in the both in the optical and the mid infrared colors. So the main conclusion of from this source, um, from this color study, was that as the as in this source the accretion was happening, so that the emitting area. Uh, of the from the source was steadily expanding. So that is why the in the optical ranges the colors were becoming greater. However, in the mid infrared color colors were generally becoming bluer because of this. So next up is the we studied also the like the spectra spectroscopically also to find out the different parameters. The most in, in, in interesting evolution we found out is in the case of H alpha. So you can see how different uh, the H alpha profile varied in the different scenarios. It was first like an emission feature, and finally it uh, transitioned into an uh, absorption feature. So this could be uh, explained by the uh, discipline models of by Hartman and Kurosawa. So it states that uh, as the this can be only explained because when the outflowing area, the wind structure or the acceleration changes in the outflows and not because of the change, um, because of the variable wind accelerations you can see and this could be explained and uh, then the next step is we also studied the variation in the uh, equivalent with the oxygen triple seven three and with that of the on the co banded lines so we could find out that uh, in that there is a in the CO and the equivalent width of the oxygen triple seven three. It it was non varying. It was almost constant uh, within the error bars, and also the CO banded lines were almost constant throughout our study. So the main implication was that after the outburst, the second outburst. After after this second after this second outburst, the disk has stabilized. And uh, that has, and and that has, and now the system is more like an outflow dominated in an outflow dominated regime. So these are the ma major discussions, uh, ma major findings of the source. And one of the major finding was the absence of the bracket gamma line in emission, or that of that helium ten eight thirty line, which suggests that this source has been accreting by a boundary layer. Accretion as opposed to the previous case of Gaia 20 EAE, which was accreting by magnetospheric accretion. So, boundary layer accretion is like a more extreme form of accretion where the inner disk the disk instability is so much that it crosses the magnetosphere of the star and then back onto the premium sequence star, and the accretion happens via the disk width directly onto the star. So, we found signatures of that also in this source. So now next up is the evolution um, on the calibration results of these two instruments, which of which I was a part of. 
So just for a uh, sake of this is in the 3.6 meter DOT and this is what I am standing just a perspective of the size that uh, to give you a perspective on the size of how big it is and it is this instrument is called the tank spec instrument this one which I worked on. So first of all, first of all I will talk about the telecam two. So on the main in the major parts which I was uh, part of in, in the calibration instrument, this is the this is the telecam two instrument. It was initially during 2017 it was in the main port, but after that it, it has been moved to one of the side ports to accommodate tank spec. So these are the sky brightness, then infrared near infrared sky brightness of the Devastal up there on the observatory side, like uh, in the GH KN bands, and you can compare them with the with other observatories, so which you can find that it is almost as compared, the site is almost comparable to the leading uh, sites in the world in the on the observatory sites. And uh, the seeing of the source and seeing of the site, which we found out is the best seeing was around 0.5 arc second, but the median seeing on a typical night will be around 0.6 arc second uh, on this side. And also, and uh, you can see the image quality also. I have compared this source with the Dumas, and you can see how well result the sources are. And this is uh, the journey three cluster. Of, of the core region of that, and we have observed the source of the core region and compared the resolution. So these are the main limits for that for this uh, exposure times in JHK, like around 100 meter, uh, like around 10 minute to around 1000 second expected. And we can reach up to like uh, 90 magnitude in K band with a 0.1 man accuracy. And and uh, these are in the telecam two. Uh, it has one feature is that it has this narrow band in limits, which is a mid infrared band. And you can see how we can also observe around 9.2 meg with this using a ground based facility, which can be a very complementary to that of the wise lasers because wise generally begins to saturate at this uh, higher magnitudes, but we can easily probe them from the ground level using the DOT telescope. And this is these are the color transformation equations. That we used to and that we have generated to convert the instrumental magnitudes into the standard magnitudes for telecom to what, what was the southernmost that you can go? That you so know. the observatory site is located at 29 degrees, so north, so it can go up to around minus 30 degree or 30 degrees south. <laughs> So next, moving on to the tan spec. So this tan spec instrument that I showed previously, it is a special one as it has the it has a different array than compared to that of the telecom two. Here we have the HCDT array or the Hawaii page two array. So it is like the to put it in simple terms, the and the infrared array that has been used here is the same as that was placed in the JWST for the gain infrared observations. And it is a very special array because the HCDT a CDTE array and the it can be the, the doping can be tuned to match your of the desired observations. And another feature is the uh, feature of this is in the in this array has the till now the most least uh, dark current recorded means under current technologies. So I will so first of all I will show you how the gain of the array is uh, varied. So this uh, transfer array it has two different uh, parts. One is used for the one chip is used for the spectroscopic purposes, which is like a 2048 into 2048 pixel. Another another array is there which is used for the imaging purposes, which is like around 10242 1024 array. So both these arrays had and uh, arrays have different gains and the H2RG array, which is used for spectroscopic purposes, it has two gain modes like the high gain mode and the low gain mode. So and in these areas, the gain modes are uh, calculating um, the gain modes are different. And as you can see, these are the two gain modes and uh, the limits. And these are also the readout noises. So here there are a lot of things to discuss here. I think I don't have time. I can uh, after finishing here, I can talk. Uh, and these are the different saturation levels. And the most thing about the dark current I was telling you, you can see this is how the dark low the dark current is for around a five minute exposure. These are the main uh, selling points of this one. And uh, 
Finally, you can see these are the these are the resolutions that we reached with a point of five arc second and one arc second for a variety of sources one for different magnitudes. And it was from around 0.5 micron. It is like an optical to near infrared from 0.5 uh, micron to 2.5 micron. The limits are. These are some of the sample spectra. And uh, these are the limits on the faint limits and how faint you can go with this telescope, with this instrument. Thanks, for And uh, moving on, these so are. What happens? Yes, uh, so, this is how you say how faint you can go. Uh, then you're limited by what confusion or or dark. Uh, it is the one is the instrumentation uh, instrument limit. Another one is the sky brightness limit. Yeah. Both. It is a which one is the worst? Sky so in the yeah the sky brightness is worse because I showed you how the sky brightness was. It was at sixteen mag and all. So. These are the image qualities with the ten step. You can see here again. We are, again we found out that it has a sub arc second ima uh, image quality on the side, and like a K band image of the M fifty three global cluster. You can find out how can better you can resolve all the sources. And uh, these are the imaging faint limits. These are the color transformation equations of the ten step that we have developed, and. Uh, Finally, these are the major conclusions um, on this instrumentation project. Like with that, they came to we tend to lunar occultation or transient events and spectral imaging. One of the highlights of that it came to was the we studied. Uh, there was a study about the uh, Pluto's atmosphere <coughs> using lunar stellar occultations, and with ten spec we can involve. Uh, we, these are the possible science cases that we can prove. I, I have proved the. Young stellar objects which I work on, and uh, summary. These are the highlights, major highlights of my thesis that I did during my time and PhD time. And I would like to thank my PhD guide Saurav and see Dr. A. S. Gore, who was my uh, co-supervisor. Thank you. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. So this is the Devastal Observatory side with the DOT here. This is the 1.3 meter telescope from the tech. And this is the one of the liquid mirror telescope, which is a survey type telescope and zenith observing. What's the elevation for this place? Do you know? It is around 2500 meters. Okay. Questions? Yes. <clears throat> you show some uh, spectra uh, in the near infrared yeah. that uh, look to me extremely high quality. Uh, okay. Is it normal? Because I know that uh, in the near infrared, uh, spect spectroscopy can be very tricky and it's also yeah. very We have to take some special care by taking the near infrared spectroscopic observations. So there is one technique called differing the telescope. So first we point one, uh, suppose this is the slit. So first we point we point out put our object to one part in the slit and take a exposure maybe around five minute exposure or something and then move the telescope such so that the object moves on to the other point in the telescope in the slit and then we take another spectra so we take the spectra like in pairs and before extracting the spectra we yeah. process those pairs like we do a suppose name it as A and this as B. We do like a A minus A minus B and get a resultant spectra, which greatly enhances the quality of the extraction because it does away with all the red noise, dark currents, the sky brightness stuff. So in that way, we can enhance the quality of the spectrum. And what is the typical magnitude limit you can go to have a decent uh, like signal to noise spectra, signal to noise uh, five? Yeah. I see them. Okay. Yeah. So 15. Yes. Okay. Okay, thanks. More questions. This is for a single integration. No. Oh, it's multiple integration. Multiple integrations. This is like by co-adding this K minus B pairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, and what if you co-add more observations that you get better? 
there is a limit to that as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You cannot do an infinitely a day like unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And you mentioned two kinds of aggression towards the uh, towards the star. One through the magnetosphere and another for the disk goes yes. across. So and uh, you call it boundary layer. Boundary layer. Yes. So uh, what's the process that causes the accretion once it completely crosses the magnetosphere? What what makes the gas fall into the star? Where where does the uh, angular momentum goes? So like in the normal case, like uh, this, uh, normally these interstellar objects, the accretion in the steady state happens by magnetospheric accretion. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the, there, is a there is a concept called the rotation radius, like the innermost part of the disk, it has the same angular momentum as that of the, uh, of, of the star, premium sequence star. So the material that is coming out from, uh, so if this is the star and this is the disk around it, so there in near to the uh, innermost part where it, the rotation radius is here, the material coming, getting uh, clogged up here, it is getting here and from here through, magnetos, uh, through magnetic flux lines, it is good falling onto the star in a free fall way. And in the boundary? In the boundary layer, it, ha it so happens like that this magnetosphere acts as a barrier. To, um, for the innermost part of the disk in the magnet in the boundary layer accretion, this the inner disk becomes so much perturbed that it uh, crosses that magnetosphere back onto the onto the star surface, and then the accretion happens directly on the, through the mid plane. It goes all the way to the star. Yes, directly. That is the current belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you tell them apart? You said you were able to infer in one of the cases that it is either this or that. Yeah, so this can be uh, okay. Just a so in, for the boundary layer accretion, there is a, a certain uh, phenomena is that, that you can see that the calcium triplet lines. The calcium triplet lines, if they are in uh, emission, there are various models by like Mozero and others. They have uh, shown that for a magnetospheric accretion, this uh, calcium triplet lines have to have been in emission features. But in this case, uh, you will see that uh, the calcium triplet lines are not in emission, it is in absorption. The another feature is that for a magnetospheric accretion, because of the when the material uh, falls directly onto the stellar surface, a significant UV or, or X-ray emission can be uh, is produced. That that emission is intercepted by the helium 1030 lines that I have shown in the in my previous work. Here, so the, these helium 1030 atoms are present at the disk atmosphere near to the inner part, and, the, the, and those you know, those high energy photons are intercepted by these helium 1030 lines, and the, and it gives rise to a characteristic uh, a deep, a, a very deep blue shifted absorption. So that is another feature of the magnetospheric accretion. In the unfortunately, in the case of V two four nine two, we also did not find this source. Also, this this feature also hmm. it, because these okay the, the accretion is channeled by magnetic field lines. Is, is there can you detect any hotspot features? This must be localized. Yeah, yeah, we can detect it. Um, the, Actually, I have been a part of another work. So in that, we have found out that if we do high cadence photometry, mm -hmm. then uh, like in the U bands, in the bluer optical bands, we can find out there is actually a phase change of the hotspots between the um, between the active state and that of the quiescent state. Right. More questions at the back in twenty seventeen. Two articles were published about this kind of flaring accretion uh, phenomenon in high mass star forming regions. I don't know if you follow that discussion at all. Would you expect that it's simply a scaled up version of what you see in the FU Orioles and the uh, X Orioles, or is there some uh, fundamental difference? I'm sorry, I I cannot. There is there are some ideas that it might be a scaled up version, but I'm not sure whether uh, there is some conclusive evidence to that. And uh, yeah, sorry for that. 
but there has been claims. Anything else? Some burning questions, curiosity that you didn't understand? <laughs> okay, in that case, let's thank the speaker again. Yeah.